You know, it's interesting. I, um, as I look out in the audience, one of the most, you talk about serendipitous and these things that come around full circle. I'm not sure how many of you have actually given some sort of lecture or talk when your college speech professor is actually in the audience. So, <laughs> Professor Jeff Ringer, who I think I got a B or maybe, it was a hairline BC in the class. <laughs> Um, is right there, and I see he has his glasses a bit down low, and I don't know if that's a, maybe he's got, yeah. So, there's a little added pressure here, number one, um, but I've, 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 I've grown in 20 years, and, and, um, and we have a different relationship now. Um, also, I think Frank Goziak might be in the audience. He was a gentleman who, when I was in college, said, you know, you should take a pottery class. I was talking to him in the Memorial Union, and I said, pottery class? So I, you know, I was trying to find my way, and so I took a pottery class, and then, came home and told my wife that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life and she was just happy that I was going to do something really, you know, that I was really driven by. So it's great to see uh, some folks that I know in the audience, Dana DelVal, who I work with with the Arts Partnership, the executive director there, and just other folks. So um, thanks for the welcome and thanks to all the invitation to come and talk and to Michelle and, and wow, this is a really great audience. So, um, you know, I start with this poster because a lot of, this is really indicative of the way that I work. Um, I work a lot in, in teams, so I, I, I'm a professor, I'm a department head, I'm a mentor, I'm a maker, and I collapse all those things. There's no, for me, there's no boundaries between any of those things. I, I'm a human being living in, in this world, and, and, and all of these things around me are part of what can be a collective process. This is a good example. This is a poster. I work with a designer in our art department right now, Jordan Nelson, who designs almost everything that I make. I'm not a graphic designer, right? I'm not a, I don't, I can't put this together, but I can put together projects and then Jordan came and came up with branding and imagery and we work together and he brings new capacities and I think there's a lot of that conversation at this conference. But this is just a really good, and I think a really good lead into that, that it's that it's not about authorship for me, it's about the project. It's about what the impact of the project is, it's about the potential of that. So this poster is something that I've used uh, in, a, in a variety of, of projects. Um, now, when I give a talk in Houston, this has a lot more impact. Um, <laughs> But uh, you guys get the idea. Fargo is a little bit, well, I'd like to say it's a little bit, well, it's a little bit more brutal than Morris, but it's because we're from Fargo, we like to say that. But you guys know what this is like if you're from the upper Midwest. And there's something really interesting about living in, in this kind of environment. We're survivalists, and I think there's something about that that impacts the way that we make work. There's a reason I look at what I do as wanting to be functional in some way, in some way affecting the world. I think it's part of it is just a response to the environment that I live in. And, you know, I can't, this, I, I remember, I showed this image, I've done a lot of lectures this, this spring, winter, just turned spring, and um, I showed this image and I thought I could just stop showing it, but I could keep showing it because it was always the week before. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so I'm at North Dakota State University. Um, I show this image because I'm, I'm really surrounded by, really, uh, by terrific colleagues at North Dakota State. Dave uh, Swenson and Dan Severson just finished this wood kiln this last spring. What I love about this object it, it's not this kiln that's thrown together over a weekend. This thing was, was a six-year endeavor, and every weld is attended to. At, at some level, as a department chair, I was always thinking, trying to do the cost analysis. I'm like, forget it. This is this is something beyond all of that. And so this is an object that I'm surrounded by really great makers. This is my studio at North Dakota State. I show this because it's important to understand that I don't have the studio outside of the academic. It's all in. It's all embedded. So I work in the studio. The doors open, students come in, they come out. I'm really interested in how, how working in, in the environment in which I'm actually making a living and existing is an important part of, of my practice. And it really pays off. For me, I think, more than for the students. I mean, I, I'm just, I, I, for one, I'm, I'd have a tough time living in a solitary artistic life. Um, that's how I, 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 it looks. This is how it typically looks, however. It's usually full of stuff. And I'm going I'm to talk a lot about today about, I, I, I'm a Formatively, I'm a, a functional potter, a production potter, and it's, I've transitioned into community projects and into you know, more conceptually driven work, and I can't get rid of the production side. And so I have to, man I have like, like, right now I have four projects that are right now living somewhere in the United States. And it's, I can't get rid of this idea of production, and I just think it's part of the fabric of who I am, and maybe I just don't know better yet, and I think there will be a time for more reflection but that idea of production, the idea of, of making something and seeing the results is really part of, part of who I am as a maker. So I'm a maker, I'm, I'm a potter formatively, and I still make pots all the time. In fact, I've found ways to make more pots than I've ever made in my entire life. 
It's just for a different purpose. So I'm going to talk about that today. So making forms and paying really close attention to craft and how something appears and the kind of design of something is at the core of the work. I think you'll see that through the presentation today, that design is really important with all the projects that I do. There's something about making something really well that also endears itself to the public. There's something about taking care of things that it's really important to me. And sometimes I can't take care of those things. And so I find people who are really good. And I hire them or I get them involved with the project. Um, but the one part I can do fairly effectively is make pots. So I'm the potter of the operation. Um, just, some, just some images of work. Uh, this is one of the few artists talk where you'll see images of what I make right at the beginning and not much after that because everything else is about the context around it. So I went to graduate school at uh, the University of Nebraska Lincoln, which is a fantastic clay program um, and an art program in general. Uh, Gail Kendall, Pete Pennell, Eddie Dominguez are ter ter terrific mentors there. And I had a kind of uh, an embarrassment of riches of, of people around me as colleagues. And one of them was Matt Keller, who was a really fantastic potter, contemporary potter. But we had this uh, little retreat at uh, Gail Kendall's house, and we were asked to come up with an artist statement in one sentence or less. And I love this. It, it was, and isn't this beautiful? I wish for my work to be a quiet accompaniment to a greater conversation. I love that, and I was so envious of that. I was like, oh my gosh. I, I was haunted by it for a long time. And you know, the haunt, sometimes you're haunted by things that, that maybe you can't really accept into your own heart as your work because really what I'm interested in is the greater conversation and those who know me know that I love to talk my son has this great what my son has this great um, he says that my tongue doesn't get tired and I thought that was such a funny way and a beautiful way to say that I like to talk and it was just he's right it does not get so I'm really interested in that greater conversation and I think in, in large regard, a lot of us are, who are in some way engaging community and building community. We're interested in that greater conversation. And I, the, I love the poetry of this, but what, what the part that I really gleaned over the course of time is really that greater conversation part. So here's the deal. I make cups, and I love people. And here's the, I, I'm, I, I can't get over this. I remember my mother saying, what do you think you want to do in your life? I said, I don't know, but I just really like people. And she's like, I, I don't know what it, I, I can sit somewhere and, and talk to some, I mean, it, I'm just fascinated by humanity. I think it's a, an interesting time that we live in. There's a lot of cynicism. And I just embrace humanity. I have great regard for the way that we can solve problems. If we deal things on a human level scale, we can solve a lot of things. But we have a tendency to blow everything up beyond the human level scale. And a lot of my work that you'll see today deals with human level issues. And here's the typical way of acquiring, right, is money. Now, I talk a lot about, one thing I'm very concerned about is privilege. I have, the privilege, I have a lot of privilege. I'm a white male. Uh, I have a job. I have a lot of things that allow me to do some things in life. And I can't take those things away, but what I can do is use it for good. Utilize those, those advantages or the, the kind of place I'm in for good. And so as a re I look at my job as a researcher at the university with, with a sort of really intense focus on what does that mean to develop? And is it, and this is just me, but it's, for me it's not about how do I develop more financial income, it's about how do I develop new ways to think about the way objects that exist in the world. So that's the typical mechanism, right? I make something, there's an exchange, a monetary exchange, nothing wrong with this, by the way. But what's interesting is when I remove that and I begin to focus on and I like to think, and I'm really intensely focused on this idea of space. I'm, actually, I'm a roamer. This is really hard for me. I'm anchored. It's this, it's that, it's, it's the, it's this space between what we make and how we acquire or encounter something that I see as viable design space, like viable place for me to be creative. And a lot of us are talking about that here, but I think of that very directly as design space. That space between after the cool, kiln is cooled and the way that it enters into the world is really, for me, the most critical, most critical part to design. Uh, you might think, well, isn't that like, uh, you know, like uh, uh, career development? Or No, it's different than that. I'm thinking about how that space can be amplified and changed and find new ways for the things to move into the world. Because after all, most other fields have research and development ends of their, of their field. And I'm, I'm really thinking of myself as that. Like, how can I develop new ways to think about this? So let's get something straight. I'm, a, I'm often referred to as somebody who's involved in social practice, right? We've all, we know this term, if you've heard this term. And I, 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 this is my second year that I spoke or presented at the social practice conference in Portland, Oregon. And 
the, let's, uh, the, the thing is that the words like social practice, social sculptor, participatory art, relational aesthetics, and then the association with it something being new genre or cutting edge is really missing the point because really previous to 1850, everything was about this, it was about community development. Art and makers were all part of this. So the idea that art and social practice is something new and fandangled and amazing, it is within the context of the 20th century. But historically, that's what art has always done. Just go back to the Jamon Potter, ceramics in general. I was at the conference and I was in the line waiting for, for, for lunch and this gentleman behind me said, so what do you do? I said, I'm a potter. And they're like, huh, well, what does that have to do with social practice? And it was one of those beautiful moments when, I don't know if just, I was overcome with wit. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it was one of those beautiful moments where I said, well, I don't know, 24,000 years of participatory work, it's a pretty good foundation for doing this kind of work. And it, was, it wasn't a good tone. And he was like, oh my gosh, yeah, absolutely. So being a potter, I really embrace this as, you know, that's one of the advantages I have, is I have this inherent intimacy that I can leverage. You, ever, you guys all have cups, right? I mean, I look around, there's cups. You're not supposed to have cups in here, by the way. But, um, <laughs> but we all use cups, bowls, and other things, right? And so that provides an interesting entry point that I look at as just this amazing opportunity. I'm not looking, I was never satisfied with something sitting on a gallery shelf. It would disappear, and I wouldn't ever see it again. I didn't know what happened to it. I wanted to investigate that. What about the, the, the woman of, of Willendorf? The Venus figurines. The Venus is 24,000 years old of, of participatory social practice, community development. You know, we have a long foundation around this work. So I'm really interested in lineage and being an honoring lineage. And so when we say social practice is a new genre, I say it's, I don't know, it's about the history of art. It's pretty much that, right? It's about engaging community in some very specific way. The other thing is that there's an impulse to do things aesthetically. And this is, one of the, this is my son, Malcolm. And, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm biased, of course, but I think this is an amazing piece of uh, social practice work. So Malcolm was, left Cub Scouts la, uh, last year and was entering into Boy Scouts. And I have a political opposition to a lot of the intolerance that's in that organization. That's just my, my perspective. And so I had told Malcolm that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to roster myself. If, you, if your son becomes part of Boy Scouts, you have to become a member. And I said, I really can't, I really can't politically do that. And we explained why. And it, we entered into about two days of conversation, which the Boy Scouts didn't want us to get into, by the way, around, you know, things like sexuality and what it means to be um, straight or gay or any of the rights around this. Well, it was a great opportunity. We thought the Boy Scouts provided for us. And we said, Malcolm... <laughs> Malcolm, you know, if you're going to stay in, we need to, there needs to be a reason why, and you need to really come up, you know, and we, we live, I would say, in an activist household, although we're not, like, running around always thinking, we, we goof around far more than that, I think, that we'd attest to, but they, there's that kind of framework there. So Malcolm comes um, the next day, and he, he had his book, and on the front of the book cover was this rainbow that was, I can tell you, had about nine rolls of tape strapped down to this book with his rainbow on the book and then he had talked to mom now this isn't the actual badge and they found a badge a rainbow badge that he sewed pretty tightly onto his uniform and said i can't really do much if i'm not in and this is where you learn from your children if i'm not in so i'm this is my solution i was like oh i still gotta get goosebumps over this i think it's parental goosebumps but i think there's something really powerful in this and um and, and this, so this kind of, this is, this is what human beings want to do. We want to activate. We want to find ways if we see injustice. We, I think that's part of who we are. And we're also creators, makers. So I think this is one of the strongest pieces of, and Malcolm was very embarrassed about me putting in here, by the way. <laughs> I, think, I think you're going to be doing just fine, Malcolm. I think you're doing just fine. <laughs> so... Lots of people talk about a, a three-legged stool to what they do. I have a nine-legged stool, um, and it still is stable. Um, but it's not as simple as three legs. I can't, I think it's this verb, I think this is the idea I just talk a lot, and so I, but here are the things I really think about. First of all, participatory. How, in contemporary culture, the ability to kind of participate in something is really important. You can see it all around us. The ability to actually participate, be part of democracy, be part of any of these things, is an important part of what we do. And so how, is art, how, is art intersect, how does art intersect with it? And I'll talk about that. I think uh, fun. I think there's, fun is underrated. 
Um, being goofy is under, just in some way having sense of humor or looking at the world through the lens of a smile is underrated, right? And so I've, I've formed this Seinfeld School of Art, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, modular, everything I do in some way is modular. I mean, you saw the cups on my table, my projects are like this, they're modular. I, I can, they can be big or small. So everything I do in some way is modular, easy to scale up and down. Human scale, I'm really interested in interpersonal, ethical, relational, and then really in service to humanity is at the core of what I'm, what I'm interested in. And again, I have the luxury to do that right now. I mean, I, I, it's in service. Sustainable. Um, projects are many ecosystems. And the way that I deal with that ecosystem and the way that I deal with people around me and how I involve people to add capacity to my work is really important. And so I, I, I look at ways of, of, of including as many people as I can. Um, I'll show a project in just a couple minutes that had a, a budget of $500. You can do things. We, we want to support the arts with, with budgets, but sometimes it's not possible and sometimes time doesn't allow. Strategically inefficient. This is something I'm writing about right now, and that is what I think what ails us is the overarching pressure that we must be efficient. Are you guys tired of this? I'm so tired of being told to be efficient. You must be efficient. Well, I formed this like, secret society, and any of you want to join in, the Global Institute for Strategic Inefficiency. And we have, and I love this, and, I, and I've had it for about two years. We haven't done anything yet, and I think that actually, you know, but we will, you know, we will. There will be a day when this Global Institute will just blow up the world and just, but it's waiting. So I'm also, it's all about inquisitive. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was a kid who'd ask the plumber 500 questions and he would just be, I think he'd want to, I think it made the plumber work faster in our house. I was just the guy who knew that. Um, awareness of my privilege is a really important thing. And I think that's something that is all, you know, anytime we're dealing with rural communities, anytime we're working in any community, understanding who we are in relationship to the people that live there is ultimately, I think, the most critical thing. It's how I can close doors or open doors. Remain outside a category. So here's the thing. I mean, typically you'd say, am I a potter? Am I uh, an artist? Am I a maker? Am I a designer? social practitioner, all of these things that we like to categorize, we all like to do this. A public historian, which I think in some regards my work is, I'm not a public historian of my training, but in a lot of regards it can be that. Gonzo journalist, untrained anthropologist, I like when you start combining these things, and benevolent disruptor, I think I'm d definitely interested in what that means. A thorn in the side of the status quo, I'm definitely interested in that. And now we're getting somewhere. That the way that I work is not within sort of bounds or realms or any, I'm not going to be categorized. And I think that's just part of my personality. I've, the moment somebody wants to claim what I do is in some way fits into some mold, I've got to find a way to break free. And it's really provided a lot of opportunity. So I, it doesn't matter how, wh what, how we categorize what the projects I do. Sometimes you're like, that's not art. And it doesn't feel that's OK. It has nothing to do with that. And that's what I loved about hearing about John's work yesterday is, you know, the, the, um, the Great American Think Off is a perfect example of being well outside of the realm of what you should do within a, an organization. So participation is a really important thing. I'm a, and a lot of my, the, the, the lens in which I view participation came when I met Michael Namkong, who was an NDSU Rosenquist resident uh, four years ago. And he pre presented this lecture called The Aesthetics of Participation. Michael's a really amazing artist. He does things like... You know, he does things on diabetes studies and a drawing gym. He's just like, if you want to look up really amazing participatory work, look up Michael Namkung. And so the next few slides I'm showing you are really inspired by his talk and, and really moved me. And, 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 he, and I'll show this image, and I'm, I'm, I'm really proxying Michael with this, but how many of you have, have done, and I love this pose, right? This is the, the painting pose, and I, I have a painting background, by the way. So the, 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 the painting pose, you know, like we've done it over there probably. You know, you do this, right? You kind of step back, you do this. See, so, you know, that's the, the kind of thinking nod. There's a participation level there, but art, I think, in the 20th century, had a lot of this sort of passive participation. And I think it's just fine. Again, I'm a, a painting background. There's nothing wrong with that. That's one layer of participation. But I'm interested in how participation, um, be, how, how this breaks the boundaries of 
of, of you, of, the, of, the, of the, um, the audience or the consumer being part of the process. I think Ernest Hemingway has, now there's, there's debate of whether or not Ernest Hemingway actually wrote this piece, but I just, I'm gonna, I, there's debate on either side, so I'm gonna go on the side that says he did. Uh, but it, it was challenged to do uh, a, a novel in 10 words or less. Have anybody heard about this piece? Probably a lot have heard about this, but I love that his solution was for sale, baby shoes, never worn, which what's beautiful about that is you have all come up with a completely different ending or context for that story in about two seconds. And the involvement of you in that process is vitally important. It doesn't exist without that involvement, without that participation. So I think about participation on a psychological level, on, on many levels. But, so participation isn't just how we get somebody doing something. It's how we involve folks in a really creative way with projects. Anybody heard of Improv Everywhere? How, how many, if you raise your hand, have you heard of Improv Everywhere? Okay, so you guys know it's a, you, it's a big time sink, right, if you've gone to the website. Those of you that haven't gone into the black hole, it is Improv Everywhere, I encourage you to do so. Improv Everywhere is, I, I, this is the way I view it, it's the intellectual start of what has become Flash Mob. Right, flash Mob is just this thing, let's get out and dance. Uh, Improv Everywhere was sort of the intellectual, edgy side of this, and they still, and there might be agents in this room right now, who still do these projects. And here's a really good example of what they do. Um, okay, Best Buy, we need 200 people to show up and just go shopping. You know, there's no singing and dancing, just go shopping and wear a blue shirt and tan pants, <laughs> right? And what I love about this, what I love about this is that one, it's on the edge of what is appropriate civically, right? You know, it's not illegal. But if I'm walking in looking again for my, my VCR, wait, VCR, CD player, wait, CD player, <laughs> DVD player. <laughs> wow. That was not planned. That was. <laughs> and I'm shopping. I, you know, this, there's all of a sudden the whole store is full of, of, of what our employees of Best Buy or not. And they're, one of the, I guess they did this in Chicago and they called the police. And I love this. <laughs> That the police came and said, you know, there's nothing illegal about wearing a tan shirt, tan pants and a blue shirt, and shopping at Best Buy. There's nothing we can do about this. And I, I love that this is this element of benevolent disruption, right? Some interruption of civic, like, we need this. We need, we need these things. We need this kind of activity. I mean, they also have a national no-pants subway ride, which... You know, again, what, what I love about this is that if you are wearing pants, you are the, the kind of eccentric one, right? <laughs> so really, really smart intersections of civic life. I really, what, what, what Improv Everywhere has provided me is a way, a lens to view systems. And I don't, I no longer think about, necessarily about place or space, I think about systems. And that systems connect a whole bunch of different places. So rather than thinking, where should my, where, what space or place should my work go, it's what system should my work kind of move into, an existing stream of, of activity. You might heard of San Francisco Parking Day. So what's great about this, they, there's a group of individuals that found out if you plug a meter that you, no long, it, you have no obligation to actually park a car there. And that's beautiful, right? It's just understanding the structure. And once a year, they create this, these, these green spaces, which is it's just such a San Francisco, beautiful San Francisco thing to do. How many people have been to San Francisco? How many people have parked in San Francisco? How many people did not like that experience? Yeah. Well, here's what well, I think work also resides with intention. So the idea that you drive up, and I can have a real beautiful like, response to this, like, oh, it's a park, but I need to park, right? I, I love that tension. I want to park. I love this idea, and I think that tension is important. That's, that's, I think that's a balanced tension. It's, it's something that kind of, it kind of awakens my senses or my intellectual senses in a whole new way. Right? Like, I want to park, I like this idea, and I think that's an important thing. It's not always about a gift. It's about, you know, in fact, I would say none of what I do is really a gift. It's understanding gift economies, but it's not truly a gift, because it's usually tension of some sort. So here's a good question. What is the role of arts management, or what is the role of the arts in emergency management? I know we had the mayor here, so, you know, emergency management is serious business. It is serious business. Um, I know this, and Dana knows this, can attest to this, because we live in Fargo. And we have this thing called a, a flood, a perpetual flood, 
that sort of lingers over us year round. Now, you have to understand, when, I, when you have, and I, I grew up in Moorhead, by the way, and came back after 25 years, so it hasn't just been a recent thing, it's always flooded. When you live in a space, in a place that you go through such a harsh winter, and then we're supposed to celebrate when it's spring, right? You're supposed to like party, like it is spring, let's get out, we're like, oh no. Like what is going to happen this year? It's a bit like having a tornado that's been predicted for two months that's coming towards you. Now, that has a large impact, and I would guess to the mayor, like if you could think about that psychological impact of that, it, it begins to wear on the public, right? So how we deal with that situation, I don't think it can always be so draconian uh, or so efficient. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about a project I did in Fargo, which I think was, was this idea of sort of, um, I think, strategic inefficiency. It was done for very little budget because it had to be done now. It wasn't gonna be starting, I can't write grants for something that's coming next week. So here's, this is a flood map, right? This tells you that, this is during 2011, that there is a 5% a chance that, that there'll be a, a, a lake that will be like 40 feet, 40 miles wide, that the, the entire city will be gone. I mean, that's far gone. There's a 10% a chance that it's really bad, that we are probably gonna lose a lot of the city. I mean, 10%, I don't like those odds, right? And when you hear this in, well, I think it was January, when you have snow drifts and, you're, and you just got done with Christmas, this is what you're hearing. So you have some time to prepare, <laughs> right? So we, we, this, is, this is Fargo. This is Fargo in the spring. Not all the time, but we know that it can look like this any year. This is what it looked like in 2009 when three, th three million sandbags were filled. This is what it looked like with the community coming together. And there's something really beautiful about this as well, that a sandbag is, is a unique human ecosystem, right? There's no hierarchy, there's no political discussion on a sandbag line, you just get it done. It's a beautiful thing, actually. So there's some really interesting results from that. So where, what is the role of an artist in this kind of situation? Um, what is the liability? There's liability when an artist says, I want to do something about this. What kind of liability should artists assume in society? And I think we should assume far more because where there's liability, there's power. And if you, I mean, I don't mean power in a negative sense, I mean power and the ability to get things done, and really to, to impact communities. So imagine, if you could, that you're on the sandbag line, it's cold and it's wet, and you're like moving sandbags all night long. It's two in the morning, and for the last couple of hours, you're getting tired, and just as, as you're about to give up, you come across a pink robot comes through on the sandbag line, right? Like just a pink <laughs> robot comes by and you're probably like, what in the, you know? I mean, that little quick interruption, right? Um, drawn by a second grader, pretty simple. Or a gesture of encouragement from someone who's not physically able to help. I love this image, we're never too old to help. I mean, I, the project was very simple. I went to the city and said, I have an idea, can I get like a thousand sandbags and we're gonna do this project? And I didn't use the word art. Um, and, and, and not, I used the term greeting, and, and, and what they said, of course, was, and I, I think they said, oh, okay, and I had Dan Molly, who advocated, and said, yeah, he liked the idea, but he said, you know, above, it's, they're kind of like, ah, you know, a little, appease the art professor, right, just get him the bags, because, <laughs> um, so I'm, comp I'm, I'm competitive, right? I am. Those who know me, I'm very competitive. I, I was an athlete. I like that kind of, ch oh yeah? Okay. Well. So in, what we did is we, we worked with the school systems, we worked with the assisted living centers, we worked with people who weren't physically able to help with the task of doing this, this, this project, and gave them the opportunity to say thank you for, to those who do. Very simply, we had them write messages of encouragement or drawings of pink robots or whatever. And, and it was, and it really, became viral, and it became this project that I did in about two weeks, about 200 hours of work, and, and, I, and I cringe when I say this, and I'm also proud of this, but I, it doesn't advocate that we should have money for the arts. It was about $400, right, to do this project. And the impact was, I, I think, pretty, pretty massive, at least on a lot of people who, are pro, who participated. Just some images from the project. My sons actually both did, were involved in this, because it was all the school children did it. It's very simple, just bring sandbags, write stuff. The curriculum was one sheet. Sandbags say something positive, here's some markers, um, no rules. And what I loved is that the, people, the folks in the system living were really snarky and wonderful, right? Like, hope your shoes aren't getting wet, things like that. And I love that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I 
So I love this image because this is a gentleman who's uh, one of our city planners, one of, and he was, I think, on somewhat one of the kind of dubious, oh, okay, we'll do this, but, and that image I took when he's looking down at a sandbag that had an image of William Shatner on it, and it said, uh, Shatner will save you, and he said, uh, I get this, this is funny, this is, I understand this, this isn't, I said, yeah, it's not about, you know, hanging out in a museum, it's about how creativity, how the, the, the bringing some of the, the warmth that art has into these systems is a really viable and important thing and should be supported, by the way. So I do things like this. I launch and learn. I kind of demonstrate capacity and then say, now, now what are we going to do, you know? Um, so in the end, I'll go quickly through this. You can see how it went through the sandbag line, went on these pallets, got thrown through the sandbag line, and then became part of this wall. So in the end, all of these were kind of embedded all over the city. And so 6,000 people from 13 states contributed in this project. And we did over 9,000 sandbags. And um, it operated on multiple levels, which I love. I mean, it, it helped those who cannot help. Um, those that are able, it provided a different le level of encouragement. And those who are in harm's way, it provided, it was like these little, these little talismans, these little images that they understood that, there's, that it isn't just about, oh, the rich house on the river, because that's the perception. It isn't that, by the way. That it, it, but it's more than that, that the community actually really cares about what's happening. So, encounter. I do this project, uh, Art Stimulus, and I love this project because I was so darn naive. Um, I, and I love that, about, isn't that one of the most wonderful things about being a human being? We can look back even like six months ago and you go, what was that? I, what, I've grown, right? And that's a beautiful thing about being a human being. I went into this project, and I love this, that I, you know, I had this perception, I, I'm a potter, I want to go, go to these rural communities and, and um, bring art to the people, right? That, you know, these small communities, they, you know, they, they may not have access to the arts, and how can I just be, you know, sort of like a cup elf or Santa Claus and just, you know, drop these cups on, on people's doorsteps and say hello, like a handshake through my cups. And what I love about my naivete around this is, number one, that it was going to be about me giving, and number two, that in some way that it would be sneaky or covert. And I, and I, I still love the story. I think about this, that I actually thought I was going to like sneak around town. And that doesn't work in a small town, right? This is my naive day. You, there's nothing, I mean, I, and I love this, there's nothing, that I, that, that there's nothing about me that is that way. I mean, you, anytime, you, anytime an outsider comes into a town, there's nothing covert about it. And, and so I went into the small town, Dwight, North Dakota, and you know, began dropping these on the, on the folks' doorsteps, which has a tension, by the way, right? There's a tension of somebody who's here and why they're leaving a cup on my doorstep. It is, it's, it's a gift, but it's a gift with some tension. I understand that. Um, but what happened, and this is where I look back and think, oh, I had no idea what this is going to be about. Now I know. And this is really where I, the idea of coming in with a question rather than an answer. So what, what really it has become, and I've done this, I do it every year in different, in different capacities, is really a way to, to greet a, a bunch of people I don't know. And the cup is a perfect intersection. It's a perfect handshake. It's a perfect way to move into space because it's something so common, something so usable. And so here's a, one of my favorite examples. This is Ella. Um, she's 101, and I, 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 had, I had left the, the cup. I'd, I was, you know, putting the cup down and looked up, and there's Ella. And she's like, what are you doing down there? And I love that. And, and then she said, well, and I said, I, yeah, it's, I was, I'm a professor at the university, I'm doing this thing, and because uh, I, I, I thought I could use that in that way, I'm not creepy, and maybe it, that doesn't exclude <laughs> you from being that, by the way, um, <laughs> but at least it was some armor. I, I think I have a disarming kind of presence, too, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, and I think that's part of understanding my capacities, and I truly do love people, and that's not a, that's not a, a sort of act. And she said, well, why don't you come on in? And I was shocked. Like, all of a sudden, who's tense now, right? <laughs> right? I'm entering into the lair of a 101-year-old in Dwight, North Dakota. And I'm like, OK, yeah, oh, all right. And so I went in, and what was wonderful is that she poured a cup of coffee in this cup. She held it in her hands. And we had a conversation about life. And, and it, I still am in another goosebump moment. Because just through memory, I just remember how wonderful this was. And I said, well, this is really the rest of my life's work right here. This is it. This is three, this is three years ago. And I've been working on this kind of work in just kind of experimental ways for 15 years. But I knew at this moment that this is, what, this is the rabbit hole I've now I've gone down. And what I love about this one, I mean, I still remember how blazingly pink the walls were with this. This, this was like 
Um, golf course rough length green shag carpeting. <laughs> really intense. But that moment of, with her and her, um, her sort of critique of my work and what was happening was profound and learned a great deal. I, I found out that it's not what I'm going to bring to the community on some level, it's what the community is going to bring out to the rest of the world. And, and I, I can be that kind of, that I can be the webbing between that. I can find ways to, to, to assume that role. So I do it in, in some, I've done it in Red Lodge, uh, Montana, Dwight, Nebraska. Red Lodge was about 400 homes. Each of the other places have been around 100 to 150, so small rural communities. Um, I have a fear of dogs, and um, so you think it might be crazy that I'd be walking around, and it is a bit, because this is what I encounter a lot, which is beware of dog signs. Um, I, 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 I do the project now, and this is the sustainable part, where actually, and this is, I started doing this, this is with Kansas State University, this is the grad students there, this was actually in February, and I'm not making the cups anymore, I am just planting the seed for it to happen and, and come down there and we all work together. So the students at Kansas State did this project, the grad students there, the, the potters, and I, I transitioned into these shopping bags, because there's something a bit bomb-like, what a white box, <laughs> right? But a Pippi Longstocking uh, handbag has a far more, I think, gentle presence. I didn't, see, that's the other night part. I'm like, oh, white box, of course. Yeah, no, that's, you know, like, what is that in there? Gift bag, at least you're thinking something's wacky here. Um, so we went to the, and this is a, this is the, a really quick s story I want to share about this. We went to Dwight, um, Kansas. And I'm going to do all the Dwights, except there's a town of 30,000, which is going to be a big project, but I'm going to do it sometime. <laughs> That's that will thing. I just have this. I just state things publicly, and then I hold myself accountable to it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm going to do Dwight, I, and it's the first time I actually said that with that conviction. I, I need to do that city if I'm the same as all Dwight's. So you you come into the city, and this is what Dwight, Kansas, looks like. And it's an interesting. It's an interesting community. It's about 160, 180 houses. Um, you know, 300 people, something like that. Um, and if you look on the left, there's a cafe, right? So that we fanned out, the students did all the delivery. Well, I've really streamlined this project. I, you know, I drive. But I want, them, I, I, want, I, want, I want the people I'm working with to experience what this is like. They went into homes, they did these things. But then we met, I walked in, I thought, well, what I want to do is go to this cafe. I gotta, you know, I want to go into this cafe and try to figure this, you know, I want to, you know, just because that's where I'm sure the action's happening. So I went into this cafe and the, and the first thing they said was, oh, whoa, whoa, we're, we're not really a cafe anymore. We don't really sell anything anymore. We're more of a community center. So if you're looking to order breakfast or something, I'm like, oh no, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm here from the university. We're doing a project. And they're like, project? And I got these bags in my hand. And again, uh, knowing my asset, which is, uh, you know, I just love people. For some reason, they asked me to sit down, right? I think they want, at this point, I got bags. I'm a big guy walking into a, into a cafe with bags, and they're wondering what the heck is my story, and I have a, like four people with me, an entourage of people with cups and bags. And we sat down, and the first thing he said, and I love this, he said, well, first of all, this ain't one of them Obama things, is it? <laughs> and, <laughs> no, no, it's not. Uh, <laughs> I reassured him that there was no Obamacare funding in this thing. This was, and in fact, there's not a lot of funding in these, unfortunately, on some level, a lot of these are, are just happening, right? Anyways, uh, what was wonderful is that we got to the point where th this was a, 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 a cafe full of ranchers and farmers, and the connecting point that we found was around Earth, and around the idea of working with the Earth. And they really, they, at first they were like, oh, here's a bunch of college students coming to our town, and they're like, oh, you guys, we're like blue collar. You guys make stuff. We make stuff. And they had this really appreciation for conservation that was really surprising. We were obviously different uh, on some level, some political differences, but we found these connecting points around the things that were common. This is that human scale thing. We sat down and we talked about these things. I respected him, he respected me, I, he respected the students. They, all of a sudden there was like eight simultaneous conversations happening. I knew that we were fine when they gave me a hard time. I mean, that's always a point of, a, of, of a sort of, some sort of acceptance. So we, uh, we went through, and this is my favorite moment in this, and so we were here for two hours, drinking bad coffee, and, and so this gentleman here on the right, he was, if you're ever in a group of people, and there's the, there's the silent observer, and I love the silent observer, 
the person who listens and then once in a while will say something. I'm not that person, and I always envy that, but just the ability to sit. And he was just eyeing me up the whole time, like, you know. And so I, I knew, I, in some way, I wanted to kind of find a way that we could have a conversation. And, and so I first gave him, if you look in the front of the red cup, there's this really delicate porcelain pink cup. And I gave him this pink cup, saying, well, this is yours. And he, like, held it like this. <laughs> and he, as if any moment he was just going to crush it. And he set it down in front of him, and he said, well... <laughs> this, I'm a little worried about this cup. And at the whole time I had this really hearty green cup, you see the one that's in his hands, and that I knew I was going to replace. I thought, well, this would be a way I could kind of, you know, we could either give me a hard time, I'm going to give him kind of a hard time. And, and so I gave him this green cup, and, he's, and he held it like this, and he's like, you know, like mine. Like that's, like, that's what he, he's like, this, yeah, this is me. This is me. And I love that moment. And I, we, I also, the documentation of this is very transparent. I'm like, first of all, I'm like, so this is also part of this project, and we like to document, is that okay? And you know, it means, and we, I work with really skilled photographers who you don't even notice they're there. And, and we have still permission to do this, and it's in a public space, and we have released things. And, and he we caught this moment where he was just like, yeah, this is mine. So that moment of encounter, that moment of, of, of this gang of you know, Kansas State students and this guy from North Dakota coming into the, into the cafe, has an imprint on that object that he now owns. And I'm interested in that. Like, what are different ways that we can embed meaning in objects, in art? Well, this is certainly one of them, through encounter, through this moment in time. The embedding of that meaning is a different way for me to think about creating meaning in artwork. And then focusing on that, understanding that there's potential there, not just serendipitously kind of thinking about that. Okay, so I, I'm going to go through quickly in this project because we, we're, I, want, I, I get long-winded now. I, all of this work that you're, I'm showing you is really the past two years. Um, I work really intensely. I work on a lot of things at one time, and I don't see it stopping, at least for five or six years. And it's also the other reason why my sons travel with me a lot. My, my life work balance has been to involve my family, and it's been really wonderful. So Malcolm was with me in Tallinn, for instance, and Ian was with me in Minneapolis last week, and now they're both here today. So Kaplomacy is a very a simple project, and it's a project that's going to go on for 10 years. I have this ridiculous um, idea that I want to get this cup on the left into the hands of the Pope and into the hands of a, of the, a highest ranking Muslim imam in Pakistan. And yet you don't just do that, by the way. There's no, I have no entry point, and I love this. That so, much about our, so much about this kind of work is about access. I have no access. I'm not even going to begin to start to, del to kind of delineate or figure out that access point, but that's my goal. And I love that idea, like, how do I will that to happen, right? Well, what I'm doing is I'm traveling this cup through the hands of religious leaders around people that I can do in the United States first. And then each year I'm iterating it out further. So this first iteration went from um, uh, my own Lutheran pastor in Fargo. I, I have access to him. Hey, you want to participate? Hey, this is a wonderful idea. And of course, the image that he would take, and what, what it is, it's a box and a camera and a diary that travels between these religious leaders. And it, it, it's shipped, so they pick it up. So the first stop was in Fargo, um, and then the second stop was in the Pittsburgh Zen Center, Kiyoki Roberts, um, which happened to be on Buddha's birthday, far more mystical than the Lutheran pastor's basement, which I know very well. Then it went to Minneapolis, Minnesota, Maman Makram Elamin, uh, who in each, in, in each case was to have the object for a week, ruminate a bit about what it means to be in relationship with other faith traditions, write about that, document it. Whatever you do is fine, just in some way live with it. And, um, and so each one has participated. And this cup begins to assemble the patina of these experiences. And the cup begins to kind of, has begun to take on this life. Now a life that's obviously dedicated to provenance, right? It's dedicated to where it's been and what's the history of the object. But why, why can't I design provenance? Why can't I design the way something has that? When you, st when you start to break it down that way, it's, it's actually fairly straightforward. You just begin to create the systems and places where these things can go. And I love the images that Amakram sent, um, and his writing was really powerful. And then it went to the hands of, um, of Rabbi Stephen Carr Rubin in Los Angeles. Um, and this is my favorite photo from, the, from, this, from this, the first iteration of this project. And it was a union cer ceremony between a Catholic and a Jewish family. And I mean, it's just a beautiful photograph. It's, I, I mean, I'm not a, I don't, I can't um, critique photography the way that a photographer can, but there's something really remarkable about this photograph. 
So that project is continuing this fall, and actually now I'm starting uh, with each one of these projects, I begin to now assemble um, alliances or partnerships with folks who are in the field. So I have an interfaith researcher who's interested in partnering and understanding what this means. And that brings new capacity. I, don't, I'll, I, I know how to harvest. I don't know what to do with the data. I don't know what to do with the information. I know I, know I can bring a unique way to, to bring that information to the forefront. That's, that's the capacity that I, that I have, and I have the creativity to, to figure that out. But I don't know, I, I want to figure out what to do with this information, you know, beyond my, again, I think the, the project will evolve. So the Misfit Cup Liberation Project, which was something that, that was brought up, is based, this is, this is really the, the kind of beginning of my Seinfeld School of Art, which is, I loved Seinfeld because what Seinfeld would do is illuminate collective truths, right? It was all based on a ridiculous premise that if you just take things that we all know and experience and then create an impossibly ridiculous scale around it, it's funny, right? And in some way, it's also profound. And I don't, do you guys remember the muffin top episode? Anybody remember this? So all this in a, in a 10 second synopsis that we all know, and if you like muffins, the muffin top is by far the best part of the muffin. And what happens if everybody, everyone begins to ignore the muffin bottoms, that you have this huge glut of muffin bottoms, and, and what do we do with all of these muffin bottoms that are collecting around the world? Well, see, we, I love the idea that you take the idea of, of that that's such a delicious part of the muffin, and you create this crazy mechanism and, and thing around it. Well, in, in a way, that's what the Misfit Cup Liberation Project does that. So one day I opened up my cabinet, and there's this, I have like a Warren McKinn, all these beautiful cups, Jeff A. Strike, really fantastic potters, and then I have a plastic martini glass that's shaped like a cactus. And I'm like, what, why? And it was like this awakening moment. I'm like, why are we carrying this with us for the past 10 years? We don't use it. Like if I'm making a martini, I'm gonna put it in something, not in that. Well, it was connected to a moment when a friend had left, was leaving town, and we were at a bar, and you know, it's one of those things, you buy a martini, and you get the glass. And so I had this really interesting story around it. And then I thought, well, man, we have those cups. So I would guess that in the back of your cabinet, you have an object like this, an object that, that you don't use and you don't throw away. And this project really is interested in, and in fact, this is where it gets Seinfeld-esque. I've created an orphanage for this, these cups. <laughs> really, I mean, that's, and that's what I love about it. Is there's, um, and I can think about in sort of, I can think about it in third person because I remember back then, like, yeah, I, we need an orphanage for these cups. And I was sincere, at, you know, I can look at it. And, I, and I've continued that kind of idea that how do we create this place where all of these stories and cups can exist together and we can begin to examine what this all means collectively. Well, I'll just, I, I make pots, so what I want to do is I'll make a trade, I'll trade you what I make for this cup and the story. It's very simple. Most of my projects are very simple triggers and mechanisms because I believe that elegant works. It's not obscured by a huge amount of theory or practice, or, or, but just what it is, is it's, it's getting right to the point of, of, in this case, a common truth, this cup. So the project was launched at the Plains Art Museum. Everything, like, like most things, everything that I do, I'm really interested in the aesthetics of how these things exist. So this is the exchange. Um, posters were designed by students. The, I had students co-design the whole presentation, the whole way it was put together. So. Um, uh, and we work collectively, and we, you know, we work together on this project. Um, and it provides students an opportunity to bring new capacities and new um, ideas uh, to the, so um, Brittany Greenwood is somebody who's an architecture grad student that worked a lot on this project, and, and Jordan Nelson again, and, and Megan Johnson, who's a curator at the Plains, uh, was somebody who really saw the vision of this and said, let's put on this curved wall, which was amazing. So again, these projects that involve lots of people, and the idea is very simple. These are the cups that I make. This is what I make. And, I'm, and now I'm going to have an interesting home for these objects. And the folks came on the night of the opening, which was, I thought, you know, if we get like 50 people coming and then, you know, we get rid of 20 cups and then over the course of the couple weeks we get rid of them, that would be great. I didn't know what to expect, right? You don't know if people are going to participate. Well, the first night they were almost all gone. It was, it was like this, um, and it's continued this way, a bit like a a, a Black Friday combined with an art opening. And Chris was actually the PR director at the Plains at the time. It was a, a bit like that. It was a bit chaotic in a good way. A bit more subdued. It, it was a Black Friday in, at the Houston Biennial. It was, it was less subdued. I just like, if any way that an art opening could be like a Black Friday, it was a bit like that. So what there was was this, this um, we have this kiosk. You fill out, you can see folks waiting. Um, this is kind of, there's instructions on this kiosk. 
you do, in this case, you shot photos of, of folks in their cups. And then it's a very simple mechanism. You put your cup on the wall in your story. And, and the cup, and, and there's so many amazing stories within this project. <laughs> but, well, no, I'm going to... I'm going to let you all read this now, because the first reaction is that. Now read it. Yeah. So I can't invent that. I can't make that. I can only facilitate that. I can only facilitate the opportunity for somebody to come in and move an object. I, and I think the part that really gets me is that he's an everyday in prison for one Every, every day in prison for a year and then three years out because that's what routine does. And this is an opportunity to move that, that, that object behind. Now the really powerful thing about that night and those that were, were there is that when the, when the story was first went up on the wall, it kind of went through the crowd, right? And then all of a sudden there was this little ring that formed around this gentleman who's here and I have permission to, we've talked about this. And he became the, the star and I became the observer. It's a perfect situation. And his story became, it was like, it was a transformation of him, but more importantly, it was a transformation of the folks that came to the opening. And maybe a transformation in the way that you guys thought about XCon until you read that. This is a really strong human being who's moving on. The first thing we do is say, what did he do? Well, it doesn't matter. He's living in, in, in our world now and is moving on. And uh, it was a really powerful moment. And these kinds of moments have happened this, this project is, um, the goal, the, the project will be in um, uh, about 20 locations globally and it's going to collect a thousand cups. And I think I'm lined up to hit every continent, including in Antarctica, because I have a friend who works there. Um, or has a friend who has a sister who works there and I'm going to give him like five cups. <laughs> just to say we were there. Um, but it was in Estonia in, in the fall, this past fall, and that's where Malcolm came with me. Uh, we went, I went there for 10 days. The objects, and this is what's becoming really fascinating about the project, is that the objects, obviously, that are in the back of our cabinets are different, depending on the culture that we live in. There wasn't the, the OK tire cup in Tallinn. There was a lot of handmade objects. And the other thing that there was, was really powerful, were ex-Soviet issued objects that people would move, and much older objects, and objects with far more dark humor. And it revealed a lot about that culture and that's what this project is about. Like, and I can see in the end, when I have a thousand of these objects, how I'm going to curate these stories. So for instance, I want the gentleman who had the ex-con cup to write a, an expanded version of, 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 the, of the history of that object. And I have contact with a woman who took a ferry in from the island to bring the, her last um, uh, state government issued cup uh, to write more of a story about that. So how can, and there's going to be a book. So how can I involve the folks who participate with the end product of what this is? And in the end, I think it's going to be a really fascinating um, sort of cross-section of our culture, of culture globally. It was out of the Houston Biennial in Houston, in Houston, Texas, which is the Enseca Biennials. Every two years is a really large ceramic exhibition or competition. Um, and then recently, just like two weeks ago, I'm doing these, this is this modular part. I'm doing these now as a community conversation, which are 30 cups and then and then folks get up and tell their story. It was really powerful in, in Minneapolis, and we taped it. We don't have, it's not edited and ready for release, but the, the stories are really interesting, and having people actually tell the stories as well as write them was a powerful thing. And it became part of more of a community, of, a very specific community event time. And so the idea of being 30 is much more, this is very manageable. I throw it in the back of my truck, I have cups, we go to a small community, make it happen. Different than putting this huge piece out. So in process, I have been in conversation with Amsterdam, India, Taiwan, Australia. Um, again, a thousand cups um, globally will be collected. And I think I love that it's, and I, most of my work starts this way. It starts in the town that I live in, in the city that I live in, in Fargo, and then expands outward. So how do I work locally and then broadcast globally? And I think that's an important thing to do. Like, how do we, how do we um, connect the small towns we live in? And in fact, Fargo has an amazing cachet, partly because of the movie. <laughs> But when I'm in a place like Tallinn, they knew Fargo. They're like, Fargo? I said, yeah, it's about 50% like the movie and 50% like maybe Madison, Wisconsin. Maybe that's a little aggressive, but I like to think of it that way. <laughs> or becoming, maybe 10% Madison. That'd be better, Dana? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, again, optimistic, right? I, I, I see yeah, aspirational. <laughs> that's right. So finally, I want to show you a project that I'm working on right now. Um, again, the Misfit Cup is going on. 
This is a, called the Bowls Around Town Project. And it's related, and all my projects kind of iterate into new projects. So the, the, the Kaplomacy Project, which is traveling around um, to religious leaders, led into this project, which utilizes the same mechanism, a trunk, and in this case, a large dinner bowl, and a box, and a recipe book, and a camera. And I'm going to show you a short video, because I involve a lot of um, different mechanisms to reach communities. And one of the mechanisms I've been using this past six months or eight months and learning a lot about is how to use three to four minute YouTube videos to actually get into communities. And it's a really effective method. Um, Chris, you'd appreciate that, right? So let me just pull this up real quick. There'll be a, a bowl and a box, a serving bowl and a box. The box is uh, beautifully designed, it's beautifully constructed, that will hold the bowl and a camera. And then this little hardbound book, that's a diary. It's there, they'll fill out the, the, the book, which will, will ask that they write down their ingredients and recipes and how they prepare, write down kind of where they got the, you know, what's, what's inspired them to use this recipe, and then to ruminate a bit or talk about what it means to, to have dinner together. My hope is that when people think about what they make or what they, you know, it all depends upon a lot of variables, time, how much time people have, and there's no right answer. Not everything has to be really poetic. Um, but that there's some, there's some thought put into what, what would you make and what would you like to share as a recipe and what would you like to share as part of who you are as a family or as a unit and um, how can that be something that might be valuable to a, a, another group of people. And part of this is that, that this will become in one way, in one kind of form or another, a kind of community developed cookbook. A community developed cookbook that's, that's not only the, the ingredients or recipes, but the history of the recipes and, and then the photographs of this in a natural location and, and then the handmade object with that and how the object is part of the center point of that. So there's a real opportunity, I think, for people to think about this as a way to communicate to other folks about maybe even some things they value or things they care about. I'm the, I'm the ceramist, I'm a designer, I'm creating the framework for this, I think, interesting things to happen. And then finding ways to harvest that or bring it back to then share with the general public in a broader way. And what better object than a functional piece of ceramics to do that? I mean, it's the perfect intersecting point. In 1988, I was uh, in high school and my grandmother, she was an amazing woman, and she died suddenly, which is, of course, devastating, right? Very difficult situation. And about um, a month after she passed away, um, you know, we're all, you know, we're getting over it, we're, we're dealing with it. I opened up my freezer, and there was this loaf of black bread in the back of the freezer. And so here's the deal, my grandmother, was sort of famous for this black bread. We pulled, if you can imagine, right, finding this loaf of bread. So we pull this loaf of bread out, and it's like the, the holy, I don't even know, it's like, it's like it was glowing, right? <laughs> it's a loaf of bread, for goodness sake, but it's grandma's uh, loaf of bread. So this recipe is no longer just a recipe. It's a recipe that's connected to a, a, a sort of tradition or a person. And, um, and that kind of, so that story, right? That story that's in there, um, is something that I, I'm really, I mean, it's just I'm driven to understand those things in other people. Part of my interest is because I love to tell stories. A st storytelling is a way that we bridge, so it's a common ground, right? So some of those stories, and that's what I love, some of the stories are very guarded. This came from my cabinet, or this, you know, when we get recipes, this is just a recipe I make every Friday. Some people will be prompted or inspired to open up more or share more. So that's what I'm hoping. That you know, that's that's what I want to see happen. Uh, that's why I want to actually facilitate. It's not me doing it. It's the public who participates. I'm just hoping to set the right kind of framework in place for it all to work.
So this is in Portland, Oregon. I'm doing it through the Museum of Contemporary Craft. And um, it's actually, in, it's, it's happening right now. I was just out there two weeks ago. Like any project, I don't come into it with the answer. I come into it with, with, with creating, again, a framework and wondering what will happen. I mean, kind of discovering what will happen, really. And um, so there's three different systems in which this is moving into the city. One, it's um, going through the fire stations through Portland, which is really interesting to me. And in fact, that part of this project has prompted a whole different project already from that. So it's going to, and, and part of that is to document, and I love this, to document some of the, maybe even the myths that we have, like what is a fire station? Do they hang out and make, well, in Portland, yeah. And, it's, and the, the information that's come back is, yes, they're competitive. Yes, they are foodies. Yes, they're a brother and sisterhood. And this project in some way honors that. And the way that really worked is when I went out there and was finally able to go and, and meet with the firefighters, because this is that human scale thing, they understood that what, I was, what I'm really trying to do here is, is illuminate the wonderful kind of culture that they, that they live in through this project. It isn't about art. It's about maybe public history, or it's about something that's kind of categoryless in a way. And I like that about it. But it is illuminating some really, I'll show you some of those, those photographs. So this is how the, the box comes. And it's, again, it's all about something being really well made. Um, the boxes are made by a, a student at North Dakota State, Michael Weiss. I, I have a new fascination with fabric stores, by the way. I didn't know this. But the moment you go into a fabric store with purpose, I, I, I can't. I, I, it took me two hours to pick this fabric out. I, there was so, it was so overwhelming. And I am now going to find ways to work with fabrics because it's really, I think, allows me to do this design work. Wow, anyways, I, I, mean, I can see quilting soon. I mean, I just was blown away. Anyways, so, you know, I learned how to do this upholstery work. I uh, learned with Mike. It's about this being exquisite. The bowl is made really well. The box, the experience of opening the box, the lid slides and it makes this sound. That experience honors, the, the, it says to the person that I'm working with that I care and that I hope you care too. And that, that's that nonverbal. It also, that's interesting about when I proxy myself through objects, I remove a lot of the privilege, right? It, that box in the bowl isn't a, a, a white Minnesota professor from North Dakota. It's a box in the bowl and a camera and a diary. And the bowl becomes the, the thing that's doing the interviewing, that's doing the journalism. And I think that's an interesting element to this. And again, being aware of that and understanding that is an important part of what I think is a healthy practice for me. Um, so quickly, from current slide. So these are just some of the images that we begin to get back from the fire stations. I, I love this image, this bountiful salad that's come out. And then what accompanies this is then the recipes and then the history of the recipes. I'm really interested, okay, so where did this hit? Why do you guys make this? And is this something you make consistently? Knowing that ahead of time, folks are selecting recipes that have this kind of grandma's loaf of bread quality to them. And I'm interested, again, like a bit like the cup, harvesting that. And then bringing that together, and what does that look like? And I, I love this idea that it's not what does cooking bring to the art, so what is, what is being a potter bring to the, what, what is a cookbook? And in the end, the outcome is going to be this, this cookbook, and the cookbook's going to be far different. It's not going to be just recipes and images. It's going to be these layers and these interesting parts. And I'm going to work with, I have a food writer that's interested in working with me on this. And, and so just bringing together this thing is a different way of working, right? It, it, I'm a potter, but I can be a cookbook maker. There's no rules, right? I love that. Um, so just the, some of these images, again, I mean, I, I love this image of the steam coming up and just, you know, in process, in making. I love this image, like the randomness of the radio sitting next to the bowl. Like, after a while, what they, what's happened, too, is I know that they see, because they see what images come before them, because it's in the camera, and they're competitive. So they're like, oh, yeah? <laughs> and, I and so I'm like, how do I tap into that? So there's this culture around fire stations that actually now I'm going to do is, from this project, is create, I have some... Um, connections with a student in Pakistan and some other places that I want to create and look at this situation. Firefighting is an apolitical situation. Maybe mayors would and other towns, but we should just thank firefighters, right? Volunteer or otherwise, right? Like, you can't argue with it. And, and so if you take that apolitical position in any community and you begin to link those apolitical positions globally, like what, what do we begin, how do we begin to build a bridge between, again, human scale interests? There's obviously a brotherhood and sisterhood in the fire station I've discovered here. So now, how can I examine what that means in other cultures and how can I connect? So that's, the one, that's this rabbit hole thing. I have like about 50 years of work in front of me and about 40 years to go. So um, I'm always interested in, in productive collaborations. 
So just some more quick images from that. Also going through a variety of food groups around Portland. I mean, they're obviously something that would be a great target. Folks are really interested in food. Um, and uh, in a variety of contexts, from uh, a de developmentally disabled center that, that is a, a farm and they do a lot of cooking, to uh, you know, more you know, cuisine-based or foodie-based food groups. So this is a um, Kitchen Commons in Portland, which is a, a kind of a CSA. Um, but I just love the images. Again, I don't, I just prompt and say, you know, think about these things when you take a photograph. And I love that I just give people the opportunity within this to be creative and to tell their story. And all I'm providing, again, is a really well-designed, well-organized framework to make it happen. So these images, again, these are coming from the, from the, from the folks. And, and they're part of this. And they're... And I have a system where it's all these sign up and they become acknowledged in the back as, as the participants. Now, it's also going through the library system. Now, this is, this, this is something I'm so excited about. <laughs> it's a bit like the gentleman who I showed earlier who didn't quite understand the sandbag project and then saw the, folk, the, the gentleman who's in the kind of civic structure. Well, a library system, when we're, we're approached with this, we're like, oh, you know, it took some, it, it took some conversation to make it happen. Like, well, what do you mean? And they said, okay, well, you know, we'll do this, but I think there was a suspicion that it wasn't really going to be very effective. Um, well, they underestimated the power of art, right? And that's, that's a beautiful thing. They underestimated the power of participation. They underestimated the power of, of an idea where people could really have, have a voice in something. So it's, I love that a project of mine is listed in a library system, number one. There's just a sort of satisfaction in that. I mean, it's sort of self. This is one of these moments where I'm like, that's, that's pretty um, it's still listed, there's 52 pages, and the call number is bowl, right? Um, it's in English, and, but, uh, we, it, but part of it is in, is in is Spanish as well. I mean, we've done the translations. Um, the notes, there's a title on the box. Um, there's my name, and then the characteristics of what's in there. I love that's in centimeters. I just love how the library system um, brings that into their culture and examines it through a completely different lens. Love it. I mean, I learned a lot from just seeing that. And then, here's the beautiful part. You look up there, total copies two, available zero, holds 43. That's not bad. The library, because this is out for two weeks, the library thought, well, well, this will be done in a couple months. Well, this is over a year's worth of holds right now. Um, and I think it's just kind of building. This has only been out there about a week and a half. And the community wants to make this recipe book, so I have to now respond. There's no more budget, but I have a responsibility for this thing to happen right. And so they're going to get two more boxes, and we're going to make it happen. And they're going to get two more bowls to kind of free this up. And maybe it's in perpetuity, which would be very interesting. Like, how does this continue? And how does the use of this kind of system, again, I'm not looking for a space or a place, I'm looking for a system, because a system is also a place for work to exist. So my, my Kind of motto is for this project: Why hang a painting in a library when you can use a library as a way to move ideas into the world? I mean, that's kind of the way I look at things, and it's working, and it's working really effectively. So I also take time um, to make sure this is documented really well. So Heather Zinger, who's an artist in Fargo, um, I hired her to come out to, to Portland and actually go through one of the processes with somebody who checked out a, a book. And you get, I mean, I'm not a photographer. So I'm going to hire someone who knows what they're doing and really capture this. So she did a fantastic job of putting together these images of everything from the process of checking out. I love that image, right? Leaving that's a beautiful library. Taking it home, going shopping. <laughs> Every step was documented, which I love in this process. The cooking, even the cleaning of the bowl, the writing of the recipe, the story of the recipe, which all is contained in this really beautiful diary that then becomes translated into this book. And then they went on a picnic, which I love, and they're all dressed so hip. I have one hip thing, and it's my wallet, right? <laughs> it's canvas, right? But they're, it's, just, it's beautiful. Like, everything is so not Fargo in a way. But I love Fargo, but there's just, it's so Portlandia. <laughs> I mean, first of all, let's get things, let's get another thing straight. Portland's a good place for this kind of project, right? Like, it, I'm throwing myself a softball with this. But here's the idea that, yeah, I'm gonna, what I'm, I'm going to develop here is mechanisms at work, but then I'm going to move out into other communities because then I can say to the mayor of, of uh, Morris, 
you know, this really worked in the fire stations. What do you think? Do you th what about documenting some of the civic structures in Morris, you know, through this project? And you, you might not look at me quite as crazy because I've got some documentation and some stories and some, maybe a couple testimonials from the fire chief or from the mayor from the city of Portland. Just le like leveraging the ability of what you can do to make things happen and then moving it and growing it. Love this image. I could see this being, like I love this image being in a cookbook rather than, you know, just that image. You know, or that image in a cookbook, right? <laughs> if you make this, this will happen. <laughs> <laughs> I want to look like him. That is. <laughs> so I've been working on a project for about two and a half years, and Dana knows about this project, and it's finally going to move. Um, but I'm, I'm, it's just going to be a teaser. So the question I'm working on right now is, what, what is the role of a potter in the, diverse, the divis, divisive nature of our national political scene? And there's a project I'm, I'm going to be intercepting, um, in essence, our U.S. Senate and, uh, this fall. And there'll be a little Kickstarter for it. And it's just, I think it's a way for, um, access is an important thing in culture today. And I think, I'm a potter in Fargo, North Dakota, and I make cups. And I'm just finding ways for these cups to move into the world. Um, partly through this sort of will, this kind of naive, sweet will, and kind of a gosh, lucky, I'm going to make this thing happen kind of attitude, but also a strategic kind of thought process around this. And, and I think it's, I loved the, so, so many, the tenor of so many of the conversations that we've had the last two days is about well, art changing community, and art has the power to, to influence and change culture. It certainly does, it always has. It has since the Venus of Willendorf, as since the Jamon pottery of the, of, of the 5th century BC. It's, it's, it's always done this and will continue to do that. So thank you very much.